or is there any declaration? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> did I move too quickly? Am I good to go, Rob? Thank you. Call the meeting to order. Is there any declaration of interest from anyone? And once again, if one does arise, I'd ask you to declare it at that time. Um, item number three, business arising from the minutes. You'll notice that the motion from Councillor Desai has been moved to uh, November 12th. Uh, number four, delegations. They've been waiting patiently at the back. Norm. Relationship Norm Sandberg is the relationship manager from the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. And he's gonna give us an update on the site selection process. Good morning and welcome. I'll, I'll just ask you to press that little green button in front of you. Oh, you have to hold it down. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Warden Hicks. Uh, good morning, County Councilors. It's certainly a pleasure to, to be with you and to be with you in person rather than virtually as most of our meetings have been for the last couple of years. Uh, yes, my name is Norman Sandberg. I am a relationship manager with the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, and I would very much like to give you perhaps a refresher and an update as to where we are in the siting process. Uh, just a, a quick little personal background. I grew up at a farm uh, outside of Banks in former Collingwood Township, went to school in Thornbury and then Meaford High School, and certainly uh, competed in sports and other things with uh, Owen Sound and, and the other high schools within the county. So it's uh, it's kind of a pleasure to, to be back here and see some very familiar faces as well. Uh, so we are the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, and uh, we were formed in 2002 as a requirement of the, two, of the Nuclear Fuels Waste Act, uh, which required the formation of a not-for-profit organization to develop and implement a site selection process. Ultimately, assuming that process was is successful to uh, construct and operate a facility uh, deep within an appropriate geology to manage Canada's used nuclear fuel essentially forever. And I'll explain uh, why we talk in those terms. Uh, we do operate on a not-for-profit basis. The funding comes from the producers. So similar to the Blue Box program, it's a producer pay program. The producers are the um, the electrical companies, uh, they're all crown corporations, so Ontario Hydro, Hydro-Quebec, New Brunswick Power, and Atomic Energy Canada Limited. Uh, how are they funded? Well, they're funded by all of us who are here today uh, in our monthly hydro rates. The, uh, our mission is to develop and implement collaboratively with Canadians, a management approach in the, for the long-term care of Canada's used nuclear fuel, and it's Canada's only used nuclear fuel. Uh, that is socially acceptable, technically sound, environmentally responsible, and economically feasible. So what are we talking about? Uh, you can see the slide up above for, what, for those here at the council chamber. I'm holding a, a fuel bundle. This is the real thing. It's not full of uranium, it's empty, uh, but it's about the size of a fire log, uh, weighs about uh, just over 20 kilograms, uh, and is with natural uranium. Uh, the uranium in is in a hard ceramic pellet form, uh, so it's a steel-like ceramic, very robust in itself, uh, thousands of years to start to dissolve if it was in water. Uh, and this fuel bundle will uh, produce the electrical energy needs for the average Canadian household for about 100 years, but it resides in the reactor for a year to year and a half, so this fuel bundle would provide the uh, electrical needs for about 100 Canadian, average Canadian homes within that year. Uh, but there is a, a health risk for a very long time. Uh, as you can imagine, it's been within a nuclear reactor for that year to year and a half. The atoms are splitting, uh, very high radioactivity when it uh, is in there and immediately when it comes out. But the radioactive decay is very fast. It's so fast that it's actually shown on a, on a logarithmic curve. But if not, uh, the, you know, within the first seven to 10 years, the radioactive um, uh, decay is such that 99.9% .9 of the radioactivity has already decayed. Not to be misled or to misunderstand that it is safe at that point, even though 99.9% .9 of the radioactivity has decayed, it is still a very dangerous material and must be isolated from the environment and people essentially forever because the longer lived radioactive elements take longer to decay and for the radioactivity 
to reduce to the level that it would be in this fuel bundle if it had not gone into the reactor is many hundreds of thousands of years. So in our terms, it's forever. It is currently stored at the reactor sites, all the nuclear reactors within the world store on site uh, to, to the most, um, to a great degree. Uh, excellent storage record. There's never been an incident uh, with the storage nor the transportation of radioactive materials worldwide that has resulted in uh, an impact of, uh, to, to the environment from the release of any kind of radioactive material. So what are we talking about in our project? We're talking about a deep geological repository, a facility that is at the conceptual design stage at this point, because we don't have a, a site yet, but the above ground footprint is about 650 meters by 550 meters. The underground footprint though is about 2000 meters by 3000 meters. Now that's currently based on a projected fuel um, uh, volume of about 5.7 million of these fuel bundles. Currently, there are about 3.1 million fuel bundles uh, in storage in both a combination of, of wet storage and dry storage. As you can imagine, when it comes out of the reactor, it's very hot, not only radioactivity uh, in radioactive terms, but in terms of temperature, goes into irradiated fuel bays, which are essentially very large swimming pools. Uh, they're in a, a closed loop circulation system to dissipate the heat going through chillers and filters. And as I said, after that 10 years with that reduction in radioactivity, the temperature also uh, drops to about 3.4 watts. So remember the, remember the, geez, I'm at that age, the, uh, the, this, the Christmas lights, the, uh, so the, about the heat that, that the, uh, an incandescent Christmas tree light would put out. But, uh, and, and if they were stacked like, um, like cordwood, and you can't do that, and I'll explain that, but it's stacked like cordwood currently in Canadian terms, it would fill about 800, oh, sorry, about eight NHL hockey rinks from ice surface to top of boards. But just like that incandescent Christmas tree light with the heat generation, if we can't really feel the heat from the lights that are in this room, but if we were to pack 2000 lights into this room, the cumulative heat would be significant. So hence the requirement for the, uh, the size of the underground uh, footprint because the geology would then help to dissipate that heat as well. Uh, we talk always about a multi-barrier system. First of all, I talked about the fuel pellet being a very robust steel-like ceramic. Then the, the zircolite, zircoloid uh, material that the fuel bundle is made of, very robust and highly corrosion resistant itself. Our proposal, and it's consistent with worldwide uh, development, is uh, then to put it into a steel container, steel container that is strong enough to withstand the, the uh, forces of that 500 meters minimum depth that we're looking for, plus two to three kilometers of ice above that because of the longevity that we're speaking about, the repository will see several ice ages. Steel is corrosive, so then there's a copper layer uh, coating around that to protect the steel from corrosion. Under certain conditions, copper is also corrosive. So to protect the copper, we would then embed that in a bentonite clay. Uh, the bentonite clay has two properties that are very, uh, very helpful for our purposes. The one is that when it becomes wet, it actually expands. When it expands within these underground storage chambers that we're, we will construct that have a dimension of about three meters by four meters, it will expand up until it meets the resistance of the wall. It will still try to expand, but it can't, so it then becomes denser. And become, by becoming denser, it becomes similar to a self-sealing gasket. So then protects the copper from the water as well. And then ultimately, it's the geosphere. It's the geology itself that is the final barrier, that 500 meters of geology. Actually in Southern Ontario, uh, the, uh, the ideal depth is about 680 meters. Our project timelines, we, as I said, we were formed 2002, 2010 to 2012, we began the site selection process. 22 communities responded to that and some of your communities responded to the site selection process ex expression of interest. Uh, of those initial 22, 19 in Ontario, three in Saskatchewan, we are now down to two. Uh, one 
in South Bruce, uh, Cheesewater area, and the other is in Ignace, just about three hours outside of Thunder Bay. Um, the, uh, we expect the site selection process to be completed late 2023. Then there's about a 10 year um, uh, uh, approval process uh, that we must be going through. It's a very public approval process, um, having to meet the requirements of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And uh, assuming that that is complete or uh, successful, then we will begin the construction period again about another 10 years. So 2045 is when we anticipate operation. Operation is 45 to 50 years. Um, and after that, then there's a minimum uh, monitoring period where the, the shafts and the corridors, saturation corridors underground remain open. Uh, after that 70 years, the leaders of the time will then decide if, if it's operating the way it was anticipated to. There could be a decision to decommission. And by decommissioning, that is the, the collapse and filling of those shafts and tunnels. Uh, that's about another 30 years. So we're talking about a 150 to 175 year project. Uh, this is the path to site selection. The two important components. We not only are looking to make the technical safety case, because safety is always the number one priority, but at least unique as we started this process, uh, we have a mandate to make sure that we have the social license to proceed with this as well. So we're not just a, a large infrastructure project that is coming into a community and establishing itself. We will only establish within a community after it has acknowledged that it is fully aware of what the potential impacts may be and in fact approves or shows that it is a willing partner with the project. So in Southern Ontario, the two communities that have that uh, responsibility and that right are the, the municipality of South Bruce and the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Uh, there are six safety factors in the technical evaluation, uh, safe containment and isolation, the long-term resilience of the geology, the isolation from future act human activities. So we're making sure that there are no um, exploitable minerals within the geology. We don't wanna have uh, any reason for someone in the future to be poking around uh, at that 700 meter depth looking for some exploitable minerals. So we're looking for a very boring geology. Um, and uh, the safe construction operation and I'll, uh, obviously the ultimate closure. And then I have a map, it might even be in the next slide. Uh, we wanna make sure that we have safe and secure transportation as well. The, uh, I'll, I'll, jump, I'll jump ahead verbally anyway, that currently the used fuel is stored at the nuclear power plants, as I said, uh, Bruce Power, which is the world's largest producing power plant. Uh, Pickering in Darlington, Ontario, uh, Fort Le Pont in New Brunswick, and Jean T in Quebec, and there's a little bit of used fuel in a former research facility in Pinawa, Manitoba. So in terms of transportation, we're we have to consider the safety and potential impact across essentially half of the country, at least with some volume of fuel. 90% of the fuel is in Ontario, the used fuel, 5% uh, uh, in Quebec, 5% in New Brunswick, and as I say, just that little bit in Manitoba. But we have a number of planned and ongoing community studies, uh, South Bruce in particular, and obviously Ignace as well as a potential siting community, and Saugeen Ojibwe Nation have a requirement for uh, certain studies to be undertaken so that they have an understanding and a level of comfort to make that decision ultimately if they decide that the project is appropriate for them to partner with or not. Uh, and with some of those studies, uh, through you, uh, Warden Hicks to, to CAO Wingrove, I believe there has already been some outreach to Gray County to participate in some of those studies, because we recognize that the potential impact doesn't follow political boundaries. Uh, we've been working with the Conservation Authority, we've been working with many of the municipalities, both upper tier and lower tier within the area to get their input for these studies. Uh, I'm always asked about the potential economic impact is. I always say, though, that this is perhaps a benefit, but it needs to be balanced with the potential detriments, and those are for you to, um, for you to um, identify. Sometimes a, a benefit to one person is a detriment to another. But in terms of project economics, 
uh, during the site selection period, we're looking at about 95 direct, indirect, and induced jobs. Uh, during the construction, about 1,500, again, direct, indirect, and induced jobs. During that 45 to 50 year operational period, about 2,200 direct, indirect, and induced jobs. The 70 year monitoring period, about 300. Uh, and then the decommissioning period, about 450. And I say about because we have, uh, we're currently updating these uh, economic impact projections. And I hope to be able to come back to you early in the new year with that update, if you are interested in that. Uh, I am also meeting with your economic development, uh, your EDOs, uh, sometime in the next two weeks. We're just finalizing a date uh, to give them a better understanding of the potential economic impact. And these jobs are the wide range and as would any industrial um, project would have from custodial and cafeteria to healthcare to scientists and engineers. Uh, we are guided uh, by our council of youth and elders. We recognize that First Nations and Métis peoples um, have rights and responsibilities to the land. And we're working very closely, as I said, with Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, uh, as it is learning about the project. But in a broader sense, we are guided by our Council of Elders and Youth, which is an independent group with representation from across the country to make sure that as we go through the process, we are guided by the principles that they live by and that are important to them as well. So it truly is a collaborative process. Uh, with transportation considerations, uh, I'm running short, so I'd like to spend a lot of time on this, but there are four main uh, aspects to it. Uh, certainly engagement, uh, not only within the siting regions, which we are having here today as an example, uh, but we're also uh, starting to engage with uh, communities along potential transportation routes, uh, more in the sense of what do we need to consider because we do not have routes uh, identified yet because we don't have a site yet. Uh, certainly the technical aspects, Indigenous relations is so important as we continue on with this process and communications with the general public and obviously the leaders within the communities as well. Uh, just to say, this is the, the last slide, just to say that we are not in this alone. Uh, all the nuclear nations around the world are looking at a deep geological repository as their own long-term management plan. It is the international best practice for long-term management. Uh, and we are working not only with, uh, with other nations, but we're working with uh, most of the major Canadian universities and cons consulting engineering firms because uh, we want to tap into as much expertise as we can. Uh, we have uh, research and uh, development agreements with six other nations, uh, Sweden, uh, France, Switzerland, Japan, Great Britain, and uh, Finland. Uh, currently, Finland is constructing its deep geological repository. Uh, Sweden has passed its regulatory approval process. In terms of timeline, if we meet our uh, timelines, we will probably be about the fourth country in the world to uh, construct and operate the deep geological repository specific for our own national needs. And with that, Mr. Chair, I am open to any questions that uh, you or council may have. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sandberg. Is there any questions from any members of council? Councillor Milne. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you, Norm, for the good presentation. Two questions. Um, given the length in time of the project, uh, is, there a, is there a possibility that technology development can overtake the need to actually bury this stuff and, and we could use it? And the second question is related to the fourth phase, the monitoring of the uh, depository, if it is built, if something starts going sideways in that 70 year, I think you said period, what's the plan? I'm just gonna ask you to press your green button again. Right. Technology has changed a little bit since I was on council. Uh, so <laughs> two, two excellent questions. Uh, first of all, uh, when we started the siting process, uh, that was before my time with the NWO, uh, that original core group 
uh, went from coast to coast to coast, conferred with 16,000, 18,000 Canadians, uh, 2,400 Indigenous peoples, and various um, uh, uh, NGOs, non-government organizations. Uh, not to, to ask how specifically to build what we're proposing, but to ask what considerations should be taken into account. Uh, and one of the common themes was that the repository must uh, incorporate the concept of retrievability for the very purpose that you, uh, that you suggest. What if technology overtakes the, uh, the need for uh, a repository or more to the point, what if suddenly this waste becomes a resource? What if the technology is developed that can take the remaining potential energy within this fuel bundle and, and generate more uh, energy from it. Uh, so for that reason, uh, the concept will be incorporated. That is one of the reasons why during that 70 year monitoring period, uh, which transitions into your second question, uh, it is not easy. You and I can't go down there with backpacks and grab some fuel bundles and come back out, uh, but which is the whole purpose of having the repository in the first place. Uh, but if, if technology does make this suddenly a resource, then it's centralized and can be accessed over a very long period of time because there is a sizable resource here. Uh, and, but if, it, if that technological development occurs after the closure, after the decommissioning of the facility, uh, there has to be a very strong economic case for our great grandchildren or, or whatever. Um, to make because we estimate that the cost to retrieve it after decommissioning will be similar to the cost of putting it there in the first place. I didn't mention that uh, over the life of 150 to 175 years of the project, the 2021 uh, project update uh, has come with a price of a price projection of $26 billion in 2021 dollars. So the economic um, justification must be must be significant. Now, during that decommissioning period with that very active monitoring uh, for the same uh, reason with the, the shaft and the, the uh, transportation, underground transportation corridors being open. Uh, again, it's a very, it's, it's a relatively easy uh, uh, operation to identify and then to go in and retrieve and uh, repackage or address whatever the, the issue may be. Uh, specifics of that, uh, I don't have the technical background to, uh, to get into that. It's still under development because we still have another 20 years to, uh, to get there. Okay. Council Body, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Sandberg for the presentation. It's interesting uh, that you skip fairly quickly over how things are being stored now. And I'll, uh, I'll try and put it in such a way that it's uh, maybe not putting you in the spot or uh, you can answer one question instead of doing back and forth with these microphones. But we've basically, since Douglas Point got 50 or 60 years of uh, fuel use, fuel storied uh, Bruce Power plus other places around the uh, country. It's my understanding that they're currently stored in secure, but buildings that are on ground level, they're uh, approximately a kilometer from the side of the lake at uh, maximum. And uh, without burying and going through with this project, the, the only really method is to keep doing what we're doing, which is storing new uh, used fuel in a pretty vulnerable situation uh, that I doesn't seem to make sense. So go ahead. Uh, through you, Warden Hicks. Uh, very good question. And I, I didn't purposely jump, jump over that. I, I know that uh, some or perhaps uh, most of you have, have had a tour of the, the Bruce Power facility, the storage facility. Uh, so it is currently stored in two methods. Uh, the first is that irradiated fuel bay, that, that big swimming pool of, of water. Uh, and it must be there for uh, a minimum of 10 years to allow that radioactive decay and temperature drop to occur. Uh, and then other storage methods are practical. Uh, 
my understanding is that of the used fuel, um, there is still 50 to 60% of the total used fuel within that irradiated fuel-based storage system because there's been no pressing need to, uh, to move it to another uh, storage method. However, the other storage method is to uh, put them into a, a four meter by two meter square um, concrete boxes. Um, the, uh, they are half meter thick, uh, high density reinforced concrete with half inch steel plate on either side. And the lid is uh, double or triple welded shut. So very difficult to get to 75 tons. So again, to use my analogy about backpacks, you can't go in there with your pickup truck and drive off with it. The, um, the facilities that I've been to, Bruce and Darlington Pickering, uh, are incredibly secure. Not only uh, do you have to, if you want to be a visitor, you have to send your credentials in in advance so that there can be a full background check undertaken. Uh, then you go through uh, like an airport security system uh, where you're scanned uh, and you're also scanned for radiation uh, because they want, they, they test for radiation coming out on, a, on individuals as well to make sure that there is no um, contamination and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's only occurred once and it was local radon uh, during a rain coming up from the, from the ground in, in my experience. Um, so those, those uh, reinforced concrete steel line cylinders uh, provide a barrier to the radiation. For those of you that have been there, uh, we can be within half a meter of those storage containers and the radiation uh, is not coming through them. Uh, extremely small uh, numbers, if detectable. Uh, but the, it, it's almost, uh, the security system is almost a, a, a paramilitary type uh, with armed guards uh, and very secured facilities uh, so that the, the likelihood of uh, someone with nefarious intent getting in there is extremely, extremely low. Uh, the challenge that there is and why it's never been concerned a long-term uh, management plan is because it requires constant physical monitoring and observation. Uh, and the, those fuel casks uh, have a licensed life of 50 years. Now, there's every expectation that after reinspection, after that 50 year period, those casks would be relicensed, presumably for another 50 years. But ultimately, all the used fuel that is within those casks will have to be removed and repackaged. So in that sense, there's a, there's a great amount of work uh, that is involved every time you open a cask, even though it's a very small risk, there is some risk from radiation exposure. Um, so the long-term plan then, as I said, for all countries is to have a deep geological repository to completely isolate it from the environment and from, from people uh, there not by protecting all of us in the environment and also giving that added security. Thank you for that answer. Is there any other questions, Council? Seeing none, then I would oh, on. I apologize, Council Soever. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Ward. Um, so I noticed uh, that you, you're drilling some deep holes there, and I'm a geologist. So is is but I was unable to see on any of the plans or sections. Is the repository going to be in the sedimentary rocks, or are they? Are they going down below that to the crystalline basement rocks there. Uh, am I on? There, yes. Uh, excellent question. I'm not a geologist, so I'm going to keep it in simple terms because that's the way that I understand it. Uh, the, the target formation is the Coburg formation. So it is a limestone. Uh, it's called the Coburg, for, Coburg formation because that is, uh, Coburg is where it actually comes to the surface. Uh, so that, that uh, the core samples that we have so far uh, are promising. They're indicating that we're finding or we, we're finding what we expect to find, though the laboratory testing hasn't been uh, completed yet. Uh, it's a very tight formation. The, um, the movement of water is in terms of 
two to three meters per million years. It's, it's by, it, um, uh, not by osmosis. Um, sorry, I've, I've just, the term's just gone out of my mind, but it's not actually flowing water. That's a very dry geology. geology. And above that is the, the Collingwood formation. Uh, so it's a shale, uh, which is a clay. And then coming back to my description of the bentonite clay that we are packaging the long-term storage container within, uh, it also is extremely watertight and provides an additional uh, water barrier to the repository. So the Coburg is the, tar the, the uh, target, and then the Collingwood is above that. Below that is the Precambrian shield. Why, why didn't they consider going into the Canadian Shield, which of course is far more permeable, uh, less permeable? Uh, again, through you, Warden Hicks, uh, I'm not a geologist, but my understanding is that the, uh, the limestone formation, the Coburg formation uh, actually is, uh, has far better characteristics for what we're proposing than the Brucambian Shield, even though, the Procambian Shield is what we're looking at in Northwestern Ontario, and also has excellent properties for what we're proposing. So we're, we do have two different geologies, but they both show incredible promise for suitability for our project. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, then Mr. Sandberg, we thank you very much for that update. Thanks for coming out. Okay, council, we'll move on. <clears throat> we'll move on to the uh, consent agenda. Is there anything that requires um, separate discussion? Anything needs to be pulled there? If not, then I'm gonna ask for a mover to uh, approve the consent agenda as presented. Moved by Councillor Keaveney, seconded by Councillor Burley. Any discussion? I'll call the question. Anyone, uh, all those in favor? <laughs> I'm still now trying to say anyone opposed. <laughs> anyone opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, we're going to deal with item 7A, the inaugural report. I need a mover to put the item on the floor. Okay, very much. Very good. Move by. Um, Councillor, my apologies, <laughs> Carlton. <laughs> I meant to say Keveney again. See, it's still, it's still. Councillor Carlton, seconded by Councillor Milne. My apologies, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And with the warden's permissions, I'm just going to stay up here today. Um, the 2022 inaugural meeting is set for Tuesday, December 7th. Uh, there are still restrictions in place related to the pandemic and staff are bringing forward this report to request council's consideration for making some changes to our normal inaugural proceedings. Um, as you all are aware, in accordance with the county's procedural bylaw, meeting attendance can now be either in person or electronic and the inaugural meeting is no different. In 2021, we held it a hybrid meeting for the election of the warden using electronic poll while council meetings have returned to in-person, there are still options for council members to attend virtually and participate in these meetings. For 2022, staff are recommending some changes uh, consistent with those made in 2021, including a deadline for nominations for those candidates seeking to be elected for warden for 2022, so that the electronic poll can be established. Nominations would be required to be sent to the clerk in writing no later than November 25th, as well as confirmation from the mover and the seconder for each candidate. Given the varying and changing circumstances of the pandemic, an online poll like the one used in 2021 is recommended at this time. The reason being is that while all members may be participating regular in regular meetings, we don't know what's going to happen the day before or the weekend before, Someone may be identified as a close contact or have a positive uh, test just before the meeting, not allowing them then to participate in person. If an online poll is used, then both members participating in person and electronically uh, can participate in the election of the warden. 
In 2021, uh, only the candidates were invited to attend in person. Everyone else participated electronically. Again, while we've returned to in-person meetings, a social event is not recommended at this time uh, due to an ongoing, the ongoing restrictions and capacity limits. However, to enable some type of celebration to occur, staff are recommending that each candidate be permitted to invite one guest to the meeting um, to watch the proceedings. As well, we're recommending that the meeting be held at 11 a.m. on December 11th to allow for lunch and that could be uh, physically distanced in our county administration lunchroom following council to celebrate the 2022 warden. Um, with these recommended changes, there are several sections in the procedural bylaw that do need to be waived to allow these changes in time, online poll, waiving of the scrutineers and the requirement for nominations in advance. All of these waivings of the procedural bylaw do require a two thirds majority of council. Um, one thing that has come up since the report was, uh, was included in the agenda package are the lifting of the restrictions in some areas. Those are in areas, just for clarity, those are in areas that um, were mandated for checking a vaccination certificates, such as gyms or restaurants. Gray County is public meetings here are in a gray area right now. So, um, we are remaining with our capacity limits um, at this time. Um, that is all I have, uh, but I'm certainly open to any questions. Questions from anyone? I don't see any. Oh, Councillor Mill, my apologies. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, in the absence of Councillor Desai, I will express my disappointment that there's no social event going to take place, but the fact that we may have lunch is, is some consolidation or cons consolation. Um, but further to that, or further to my question is actually, um, have you consulted with the MOH uh, regarding gatherings? Um, it strikes me that, you know, if, if, if we're being asked to, uh, disclose our vaccination status to attend this meeting, why we couldn't do the same for uh, some other members of the public to actually attend the inaugural. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden. So uh, council is aware that we do have a, a vaccination policy in place for members of, of staff and council, and that um, there is something um, that is all we have right now. I have consulted with our director of legal services regarding uh, capacity limits and restrictions and um, the information that I presented just recently or momentarily ago uh, is what I've been told is that we are in, we are not mandated um, to require um, vaccination certificates such as gyms and restaurants. That is not something that Gray County has in place right now. And therefore, we don't fall into those changes for capacity limits. Any other questions, Council? Uh, Councilor Mackey. Thanks, Warden. Uh, I certainly appreciate, and I agree with Councilor Millen. Uh, I certainly appreciate, uh, you know, Heather, the abundance of caution that is being taken here, but, you know, when we can go to a, an attack hockey game and, and sit, you know, in the arena. Last night I was there, there was 1800 people. I guess I have a hard time struggling with why we can't get together, you know, in a limited capacity for the, the inauguration, you know, of the warden. Um, that would certainly be my preference is for members of county council and whether we limit the guests, that would be, you know, certainly something we could do, but to at least have the county council members here for the inauguration um, is important to me. and. I think we're going too far with these these precautions. So through you, Mr. Warden, just to clarify, county council members are invited. They are invited to attend the meeting as you are today. Um, and we have um, in the report, it is, it is staff's recommendation that each candidate um, be invited, uh, be permitted to have a, a plus one, a someone, a family member or a spouse uh, coming or a friend coming with them to um, oversee the 
the uh, celebrations there, but definitely we will have council here um, as long as you are able to attend in person, by all means, you are welcome to attend. You're good to go, Council Mackey. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that, Heather. I guess, you know, I'd like to see, you know, I, I know our procedure allows people to, uh, or potentially vote, uh, you know, through electronic methods. I mean, I would hope that, you know, members of council are here for the uh, the voting and the inauguration, you know, of our, of our new warden. Um, you know, just past practice, it's been a, you know, a lovely evening or, um, and I'd hate to see that tradition lost. Thanks. So just to be clear, uh, Councillor Mackey, it's my understanding that everyone will vote electronically, even if you attend in person. Confirmed? Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, it's uh, time to call the, the question. And we do need a two thirds uh, vote in order to waive certain sections of our procedural bylaw. So we'll see how the vote turns out. <laughs> All those in favor? Looks like that's carried. Anyone opposed can raise their hand. That is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna deal next with item 7B, award of the trail uh, maintenance. I'm looking for movers and seconders to put it on the floor. Uh, moved by Councillor Robinson, seconded by Councillor Patterson. Scott, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I apologize, I, I, I should make clear uh, with this one, the mover and seconders, uh, should be indicating um, either option one or option two, correct? So uh, I will maybe go back to who were the movers? Uh, Councilor Robinson, are you looking to do the 20 kilometer or the 35.5 kilometer? Which, which option do you want to move? For me on option two but uh, I would like to hear the presentation if, if you don't mind. Okay, so very good. So we have option two and who was the second there? Please remind me, oh, Councilor Patterson. I'd be looking at option one. <laughs> so, sure. Okay, so we'll say that uh, option one is moved and seconded, uh, and uh, we can amend after the presentation if need be. Excellent. Scott, you now have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden and members of County Council. It's nice to uh, see you all in person again. Uh, so what we have before us is, is a report looking at options for, for moving forward with uh, stone dusting uh, uh, approximately uh, potentially 30, 20 to 35 kilometers of the county CP rail trail. Uh, Council may remember that uh, in December of 2020, uh, Kevin Wepler brought a, a report forward uh, to Council uh, speaking to the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Programs grant uh, from the federal government. And uh, within that grant, uh, uh, application, it was outlined that there would be a proposal put forward for uh, approximately $201,000 uh, to look at, uh, at uh, stone dusting, a portion of the CP Rail Trail, as well as some additional monies uh, for tourism, for signage that they would be collaborating with transportation services on. Uh, in this case, the county was successful in getting $201,476 from the ICI, ICIP program, uh, which, was, which was great to hear. Um, and in Kevin's report, it noted that uh, depending on what the prices come in at, uh, we hope to be able to stone dust the remaining uh, portion of the trail, but we need to wait and see what the bids were. And so for council's benefit, uh, in, a, in a regular year without grant funding of this nature, we would be... Um, tendering approximately three to five kilometers uh, of the trail at any given time, starting from the beginning of the trail and, and working south. 
uh, to look at stone dusting that, uh, that uh, section of the trail. And in past years, prior to COVID, uh, we'd been seeing prices come in at approximately ten dollars to $12,000 per kilometre. Uh, so we had a rough estimate of what we could expect if we were moving forward with, uh, with this grant money and, and using some, some money from the budget as well uh, to stone dust uh, the additional portion of the trail. Um, but as we know, uh, prices uh, during the, the COVID pandemic have been uh, certainly very volatile. And in this case, the, the remaining section of the trail that I'm speaking to is actually uh, just south of Berkeley. The, the report mentions Berkeley. It's just south of Berkeley between Berkeley and, and um, Markdale uh, to Dundalk. And the, the grant money that we got uh, specified a range that we could be resurfacing, uh, but the minimum number of kilometers in that range would be 20 kilometers. So if we want to carry forward uh, with using that $201,000 from the federal government, uh, we need to resurface a minimum of 20 kilometers of trail. In this case, uh, we tendered in June of 2021, and uh, we had uh, two bidders at that time. Uh, at this time, we have one bidder uh, that's still responsive and interested in, in uh, working with us to, uh, uh, to look at solutions here. Uh, the, the bids that came in and, and the numbers that were being quoted now are significantly more than what we had previously received in, in years prior to the pandemic. As I said, we were used to getting about ten dollars to $12,000 per kilometer. Uh, now the range we're seeing is more like a twenty-three dollars to $25,000 uh, per kilometer. And, and we understand that the main reason for this increase in price uh, is certainly the increase in fuel cost. Uh, the other sort of secondary reason is that the primary source for, for the uh, stone dust is coming from a northern portion of the county. Uh, so as we move further and further away from that source, certainly the trucking needs are greater and, and stone dust is, is very, uh, uh, very heavy um, in terms of the amount you can fit in a truck. So the, the trucking costs are significant in that regard. In this case, uh, staff are recommending that we proceed with 20 kilometers of trail, and I'll get to how that's being funded in just a second. Uh, but one of the other recommendations that we're looking at through this report um, is to investigate options for how we, we uh, maintain the trail going forward and to, to bring a, a future report back to, to this council uh, to look at what some of those options would be. And uh, as part of the preparation of this report, we did reach out to other trail operators, uh, particularly those with, with multi-use trails uh, that would be stone dusted or, or a former rail trail of this nature, not necessarily forest trails, uh, to see how they maintain their trails. And one of the things that came forward loud and clear uh, in, in those investigations is that everybody's costs are going up. Uh, that's no secret. Uh, the other thing that came forward was those that don't allow motorized users on their trail, and particularly motorized users in the, in the fall, uh, spring, and summer months, uh, have significantly reduced um, trail maintenance uh, budgets in that regard uh, versus that those that allow for motorized users like ATVs uh, in the non-winter months uh, are certainly paying more for their maintenance. So one of the things that we want to look at in this future staff report is our maintenance options and whether or not there's options we can uh, do in-house or, or working with our partners uh, at the Grace Hobble Conservation Authority to look at uh, more regular maintenance and to look at how we can uh, certainly control our costs going forward. So with that, we'll get to the, the two options. And the first option, which is the staff recommendation at this time, uh, is that we proceed with uh, 20 kilometers of trail so that we can keep our, our uh, commitment in the, uh, in the infrastructure grant program. Uh, that number is coming in at uh, just shy of $490,000. And I should note that there is a 5% contingency within that number, um, but the bidder in this case has also noted uh, that things can change between uh, potentially now and next year when the work could be done. And, and certainly uh, uh, volatile fuel prices and other costs uh, could lead to, to this number going up, uh, but this is the, most, uh, uh, the best bid they can do at this point. In this case, we would be using the money from the grant program we would also be carrying over approximately $40,000 uh, from this year's budget that we had uh, planned to attribute towards this project. We'd be using $45,000 from the 2022 budget uh, for, for trails in that regard. Uh, we would be using some monies from development charges, and then we would be seeking council support to use uh, approximately $135,000 from uh, the, the trails reserve in this regard. And so if, if uh, council is supportive of going forward with option one, uh, that's where it would be funded from. Uh, if council wants to explore option two, 
Um, obviously, it's significantly more in terms of the value, um, but we did feel it pertinent to, to include option two in this report um, based on some, some comments and questions we'd received from councillors in the past uh, to look at, you know, what would it take just to resurface the, the rest of the trail at this time. So we wanted to put it in there for council's uh, information. Uh, the funding would be fairly similar in terms of the, the 2021 portion, the 2022 portion, and, and using the funds from the um, from the grant, we could use some additional monies from development charges, um, but then that would leave approximately $514,000 uh, coming from reserves. And that number is more than what we have in our current trails reserve. Uh, so we'd need to work with, with uh, finance and others to look at uh, where the remainder of that money would come from. And I neglected to say at the beginning of this report, um, I had a hand in preparing this report, but there was there was a, a large amount of work done by Deputy CEO Randy Scherzer um, and our purchasing and finance staff in this regard. So, so thank you to them for, for all their support in, in putting together this report. So that's, uh, that's my presentation at this time, but certainly be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much for that presentation, Scott. There's a question from Councillor Mackey. Thanks for your report, Scott. And uh, the stone dust does make uh, an excellent trail. Um, just wondering, has there been any reach out to our transportation department to see if they could play a role in either the maintenance or the distribution of the, the new stone dust? You know, I'm just thinking with the, the, the roadside graders that were the, the shoulder graders that we have, is that something that was explored? Sorry about that, still getting used to this. Uh, through you, Mr. Orden, uh, great question, Councillor Mackey. And that's actually one of the options we wanna explore in that future report. We've had some very, very, very preliminary discussions with, with our friends in transportation services uh, to look at what role they could play. Uh, we've also talked about, you know, would you get into a situation where potentially you're looking at hiring a student or students uh, to, to uh, be maintaining the trail throughout the summer months and, and uh, with the support of, of uh, equipment that we might uh, have in our transportation services department? And then what role would our existing uh, contract with, with Gray Sobel uh, play in that? So we wanted to, to get this report uh, before council to, to start to consider our options. Uh, but we know that that future report and the 2022 budget considerations um, are going to, I think, generate a good discussion on how we move forward in an efficient and economical way in that regard. Thanks, Scott. So just so I'm clear, did we reach out as far as the application of the new, the 400 and some thousand dollars worth of material in this? Did we look to our transportation department to see if they were able to move the material from Northern Gray downwards and actually apply it? Like, would there be any cost savings to, for us to do it internally? Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Mackey, and through you, Mr. Warden. Yes, we did have that discussion with Transportation Services as well. Um, the equipment that we have um, is is too large to to do the trail work that we need to do. So the trail uh, work in terms of the grading that would be required prior to putting in the stone dusting, um, it's uh, it's just it's too large based on the the current equipment that we have. So so we did inquire in terms of whether or not there was possibilities there. Um, the, as Scott alluded to, the possibilities we think from a future perspective would be on the maintenance side. Um, and so we're going to explore those further with transportation services and bring back a report for council. You're good. Yeah, so Council Mill. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, thank you, uh, Scott, for the report. Um, just uh, one point of clarification. I will remind everybody that when the rail line was originally built, they built it from the south north. So in fact, you're starting at the end of the trail. You're not starting at the start of the trail. So that said, uh, I think uh, it's, it's high time we get this project done. We've dragged this on for I don't know how many years. Uh, the residents at the north end of the county have had the benefit of a wonderful trail for a number of years. I think it's time that we allow the rest of the county at the south end to have access to a lovely trail as well. So with that said, I would like to move an amendment, Mr. May or Mr. Warden, to, uh, to consider option number two. Uh, 
Okay, so we're going to deal with the amendment, but we need a seconder first. <clears throat> second, Councillor Robinson. That's interesting. So one quick second. Are we going to be going to Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's good that I have our clerk right beside me or I'd be lost. <laughs> okay, so we are dealing uh, strictly with the amendment now. Any discussion on the amendment, which is option number two, moving to the 35.5 kilometer uh, project? Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you, I really like the idea of having a, um, an all-inclusive trail, and certainly as we look at um, the opportunity for anyone to enjoy uh, uh, this recreational um, tourism type activity, I think the, the focus should be, uh, should be placed on uh, option number two, and I'm pleased there's a, there was a mover for this, so thank you very much. Thank you. Any other speakers? Uh, Councillor Little. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I agree with the mover and seconder. I think um, another consideration might be the cost of materials and how much they've increased in the past year. It's unlikely that these costs are going to uh, decrease significantly over a period of time that it might take to uh, complete the rest of the trail in increments. So I would support um, uh, doing this right now in total. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Little. Uh, Councillor Milne. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, <clears throat> in regards to the other uh, issue about the expense or the elevated expense to move the material from the north down to the south, I will remind you that we do have a very good reserve of aggregates in the south end of the of the county. So I I, I don't know uh, what went on with the uh, tendering process. But I'm sure if the uh, successful tender to actually do the project uh, was to source material closer to the uh, actual application site, I'm sure there's some savings could be had. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anything else? Seeing none, perhaps it's, oh, I apologize, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Warden Hicks. I don't think this is the, the time we should be draining our reserves before we receive the report from staff on how they can save money going forward. So this would be the appropriate time to do the first part, the 20 kilometers and allow staff to come back with a report to uh, share with us how we can save money. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, Councillor Boddy. Just a quick point, uh, Mr. Warden, uh, you can ride in this uh, trail the way it is. Uh, I, I've done it. You might walk differently the next day than you would on the smoother trail. There is there is an effect uh, in the long run, but it's still quite rideable uh, the way it is. Thank you. Councillor Mill. So I guess I'd have to ask the honorable member from Owen Sound, if the trail is fine the way it was, why were we putting any stone dust on it anywhere? Thank you. <laughs> Point noted. <laughs> Anything else? I think it's time to call the question then. So we are voting on just the amendment, which is option number two. I'm going to call all those in favor. And all those opposed. So the motion is carried. Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Okay, well. Okay, on the amendment, Councillor Mackey. No. Councillor Gamble. Yes. Councillor Burley. Here. Councillor Carlton. In favor. Um, Councillor Little. Councillor Patterson. Opposed. Warden Hicks. Opposed. Councillor Clumpus. 
Councilor Keaveny. In favor. Councilor Boddy. Opposed. Councilor O'Leary. Councilor Millen. Yay. Councilor Soever. Uh, Councilor Robinson. Councilor Hutchinson. In favor. Motion is carried 41 to 35. Okay, thank you very much. And given that that has passed, I think the original uh, motion uh, fails. Oh, we have to vote on it. Okay, so we have to vote on the main motion now, which is essentially voting on what we voted just voted on. <laughs> Be interesting to see if the vote is any different. Um, so does everyone understand that we're voting on the main motion as amended? So really, what you just voted on. Okay. So um, unless there's any discussion. Ah, understood. Okay, so we need to, uh, well, I'll repeat <laughs> what, what the clerk just said. We need to make sure that the original movers, which is Councillor Robinson and Patterson, are still in favor of being <clears throat> the movers uh, for the amended motion. Yeah, not in favor. So we, uh, we have a seconder now in Councillor Milne. Okay, time to call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. All right, thank you very much, Scott. Okay, what I'm gonna suggest we do with uh, your guidance, Madam Clerk, is that we um, make the mo uh, approve a motion to go into closed session, but then take a break. Take the break before, see? Glad I have you right beside me. <laughs> so why don't we take a, a short recess? Um, how long? Let's say, would 10 minutes suffice? Let's come back at 45, 11.45. We're good to go. We're now in open session. I make a declaration that we dealt only with the items indicated in the closed uh, uh, meter, closed meeting agenda. All right, um, we have a motion to be entertained. Maybe we can put that up on the screen and then I'll ask for a mover and seconder. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I can't see it. Um, do we need it read? Does any, can everyone see it okay? Uh, who's leading the charge uh, here on this motion, Kim? No, you can't see it, right? <laughs> Tara, do you mind reading uh, the motion out? Now, therefore, be it resolved that Gray County supports the concerns raised by the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus regarding the procurement process for the advanced high-speed internet program, and that a letter of concern be sent to the Minister of Infrastructure, the Honorable Kinga Surma, with copies to Premier Ford and MPP Bill Walker, requesting that the province pause the procurement until the issues of equity and transparency in the process are resolved. <laughs> I guess I should turn on my mic. My apologies. Moved by Councillor Milne, seconded by Councillor Plumpus. And Councillor Milne, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Would it be advisable to copy uh, Minister uh, Thompson as well, Minister Vegg? I think that would be pertinent in this case. I would agree. Any other questions or comments? Seeing not, oh, Councillor Soever. Okay, a recorded vote has been requested, so we'll turn things over to the clerk. Okay, we're voting in favor of the motion on the floor right now. Councillor Mackey. In favor. Councillor Gamble. In favor. Councillor Burley. In favor. Councillor Carlton. In favor. 
Councillor Little. Yes. Councillor Patterson. Yes. Warden Hicks. Yes. Councillor Clumpus. Yes. Councillor Keaveny. In favor. Councillor Body. Councillor O'Leary. Yes. Councillor Millen. Yes. Councillor Soever. Yes. Councillor Robinson. Councillor Hutchinson. In favor. Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on to item number nine, other business. Um, Roma delegation requests. Kim, are you? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I would be interested to hear from any members of council who, who might um, wish to suggest uh, delegations at Roma. The two suggestions that I have from staff are both for delegations that would be joint with Bruce County. The first of those is um, a delegation with the Solicitor General <clears throat> regarding um, funding for the community safety well-being uh, project, the, impl the continued implementation of that and support for the coordinator position. The second uh, joint delegation with Bruce County would be um, seeking the province's support uh, to develop a human resource strategy uh, for the child care sector. There we go. <laughs> Does anyone have anything to add? Uh, Councillor Mills. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Would there be any point or any advantage in uh, delegating to an appropriate minister regarding the issue we just dealt with? <clears throat> Sorry. I, I um, I think what I, I will, I will um, take that under advisement and um, we're, we're waiting to hear back about a meeting with between the minister and the representatives of SWIFT and Western Ontario Wardens Caucus. So I think once we, if, if we have a sense of whether any progress has been made on that front, then perhaps a delegation would, would, would not be as necessary, but um, if we don't get to, uh, any action from from that request then certainly we can make this one is that okay perhaps an awkward question during the beer fest would be just a week sorry mine wasn't working to turn you off <laughs> okay anyone else Okay, then we'll move on. All right. Okay, so could I get, uh, did we not already get a mover in secondary? No, we did not, right, we did not. So I do need a mover. Uh, Councillor Body moves and seconded by Councillor Robinson. Any further discussion? And do I need to call the question now? Okay, I'll call the question, all of those in favor? Anyone opposed? That's Carrie, thank you very much. Any other, other business? And seeing none, I do um, have some, I'll mount it under other business just to indicate to everyone, I know some of you have asked the question and the answer is yes, I will be seeking reelection for warden in 2022. Any other, other business? Okay, any notices of motion? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Uh, moved by. <laughs> you, got, you got the hand up there pretty fast. Councillor Hutchison, and usually it's Councillor Burley, but he wasn't as quick this time around. Councillor Milne then, thank you. All those, <laughs> all those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. 